Good evening and welcome to Telling the Tale with Lynn Nottage. My name is Adina Varner and I'm the Director of Learning and Community Engagement at the Repertory Theater of St. Louis. And I'm your moderator for the evening. It is my esteemed pleasure to present to some and introduce to others, Ron Himes, the Artistic Director of the St. Louis Black Repertory Theater. Hannah S. Sharif, the Artistic Director of the Repertory Theater of St. Louis. And last but certainly not least, the honored guest for the evening, none other than two-time Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and dramatist Lynn Nottage. Audience, you can go ahead and put your greetings in the chat and welcome our panelists. Also, we encourage you to leave comments and questions in the chat and we'll be sure to integrate your thoughts into our conversation this evening. And so just to start us off, it is not by chance that Ron and Hanna, two artistic leaders at major arts institutions in the St. Louis region, independently decided to emerge from this pandemic season by way of Lynn's artistic and creative voice. There's something unique about her tone and her tenor that is relevant to this time and to our community. And at the rep, we are currently producing Malima's Tale. It's the only fully live in-person production of our season. Mm -hmm. And for the black rep, they are launching a milestone season in the fall, their 45th season with the production of Sweat. And both of these leaders have decided in essence to mark time with Lynn's voice and her stories. And so that's why we're gathered here today. That is why we are in conversation today. And so we'll start off first with saying hey to Lynn and, and asking her to just talk about Malima's tale and the inspiration behind creating this work. Hi, everyone. And I just want to begin by saying thank you, Ron. Thank you, Hannah. I feel very honored to be part of your theater season and to be welcoming audiences back into a creative space. It's such a blessing and, and, and it's really time. And so thank you, thank you for that. And I just want to also begin by saying that I come to you from the traditional lands of the Lenape people, and I'm very honored to be in this space and honoring the space of ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, so Malima's Tale, what can I tell you about Malima's Tale? I think that was um, the question. M Malima's Tale really, for me, came out of conversations that I was having with director Catherine Bigelow, um, at the time who I was working with. And she was really interested as I was in how we could raise awareness about poaching of elephants. And at the time when we began having that conversation, um, poaching was really reaching catastrophic levels. I mean, we were scared that in 10 years, there literally would be no elephants left in the wild. And I just took this very deep dive into the research and realized that in order to tell the story of poaching, that I couldn't just tell the story of the death of a magnificent um, animal. I really had to tell the story of all the hands that touched that elephant, you know, from the individual that killed um, the elephant to the consumers who are in part responsible for the death of that elephant. And while I was writing the tale, I also realized that I was really telling the story of climate change and of a shrinking ecosystem and of poverty in Africa and, you know, and what deforestation uh, is doing um, to the folks who live there and the competition for food between wild animals and humans, beings that all led to the poaching of that magnificent ele elephant that's at the center of Malima's tale. And for those of you who haven't seen the play yet, the um, the, the story is of, of uh, a, one of the last great tuskers in the wilderness. And right now in Kenya, I think there are only 25 great tuskers left and he's poached for his magnificent tusks and the story really follows all the hands that touch that tusk and who are complicit in that killing to the person who ultimately buys his tusk in a ivory shop in China. And so on the surface, you know, the tale really is a play about magnificent poached elephant, but it's also uh, about the way in which the African continent continues to be exploited for its mm. resources. You know, there's a scene in the play in which Malima's tusk, his personified tusk is being transported 
from Africa to Asia. And you hear the voices of all of the elephants in that space. And I really wanted to conjure the Middle Passage and the ways in which that that you know the continent is being poached of its natural resources today and also um sort of raise awareness that we're not looking at it is that we still are sort of complicit in the exploitation of a continent that really gave us so many gifts you know as i was saying there are only 25 great tuskers um in the african wilderness and just i feel like whenever i talk about malima's tale my responsibility is also to deliver some statistics so that people um, know the reality beyond the, the narrative that there are about 50 to 100 elephants that are killed every single day in the african mm -hmm. wild which i find astonishing that means that every 15 minutes an elephant is killed Mm. In 1900, and this is one of the statistics that I always find a little bit staggering, there were 12 million wild elephants. Today, there are only 400,000. Wow. Mm. And so people ask, why did I tell this story? Because in part, I'm incredibly passionate about climate change. I think it's one of the single most important issues that we face today. And um, I, it you know, affects you know, where people um, get their food, affects where people travel, it affects everything. And we're all touched by it. I have to say, um, it has been such an incredible experience to watch the audiences night after night leave the theater profoundly open, questioning themselves, right? Um, mm -hmm. Folks saying, I, I, I didn't understand the depth of the problem folks questioning the ivory in their own homes yes, and reflecting on their last experiences, those who had been on safari and the majesty of um, the heart and the epic nature of these creatures that are really captured in the story. But you know, for me, I, I wanna go back to the scene that you just referenced because um, it is one of my favorite scenes in the play. And there's a movement um, in this production built around the, the calling of those names. Um, and it, for me, echoes in such a visceral way of the middle passage. And it brings to mind what happens when we allow ourselves as a society to commodify living things, human yes. beings. Yes. Um, I hear the echo and the call of those names, and I also hear the echo and the call of the ancestors' names, and it is really this profoundly moving experience to understand through the journey of Malima's spirit in those tusks, the journey of my ancestors as well. And um, I just think that the many, many layers of conversation and discourse that um, the language and the story just like has a razor sharp edge and pulls out of us. It felt so important to have this conversation. And the other thing that I really felt um, uh, that I hoped and that I have found to be part of the healing of coming out of this year and a half um, of uh, this global pandemic is the sense of communal trauma Mm. and communal responsibility mm. that I find layered into what you have created in Malima's Tale um, that is is a gift, an, an unexpected gift to our community. So I just want to say thank you for that mm. and for that work and, and for what it's doing here in St. Louis. Thank you for saying that. That's so beautiful. And I do think the sole reason that I wrote the play is land. this land is our life and it is about communal responsibility. I think it's really easy for us to distance ourselves here because there's so much that's going on in America and we forget what's going on in our homeland mm -hmm. and that we are not good custodians of our home homeland. And I feel this immense res responsibility. And I think that you articulated it so beautifully in, in ways that I, I couldn't, but I felt are embedded in the text and embedded in the story that I wanted to tell. I wanted to say that, you know, the, I, it actually was the first production that I've come out to see live. And so that was a wonderful experience. <laughs> I love that. Um, and I want to, you know, commend Hannah Han, Han on a beautiful production. The production is just beautiful. 
to watch and uh, the storytelling is so strong and hearing you talk about, you know, how it passes the, the, the each moment when someone has touched the ivory or the ivory has the tusk has been touched by them, that moment where they're white mm -hmm. in this production is so telling and you just sort of see the accumulation of it. Yes. And um and so it 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 the, the storytelling is so rich and the, it's supporting what you were trying to do in a way of showing the number of hands that are touched from the killer to the consumer. And um, I think that's done so well and um, it's yes. very, very moving, very thank, moving. Thank you. I haven't gotten the opportunity to see the the, the show yet, but I do hope to see the, the streaming ver um, version. But I did send my best friend who lives in St. Louis and she went the first night and she absolutely adored it. <laughs> she was my spy. I'm like, what <laughs> that? I'm so like, happy she liked it. it. <laughs> she really loved it. <laughs> We'll so I have to go. I have to go through your opening night list, uh, Hannah, to find out that name, so I know when she's coming to see Sweat. That's right. <laughs> she's coming to see Sweat as well. Well, let's let's talk about Sweat. Let's talk about Sweat as well. So, so Ron, tell us when when Sweat will be premiering, and and let us know the inspiration behind that, Lynn. Um, um, sure. Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Yeah. Oh my God, that's I feel like to talk about Sweat is like an epic journey, but I will do my 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 best i mean i do feel it's 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 funny i i feel some distance from sweat and yet it feels like it's still such an open conversation right now and it feels like the play could have been written a month ago and still have incredible um relevance and so um the play just for folks who haven't seen it very briefly is about a close-knit group of friends that work in a steel factory in Reading, Pennsylvania, which is just at the tail end of the Rust Belt. And they're locked out of their their factory because of corporate greed. And the play is really racial lines in unexpected and ultimately violent ways. And so just a, a little bit about the evolution of the, the play, because it does come from me from a deeply personal space um, space. And I've talked about this a, a lot, but I'm sure um, many of the folks here probably haven't heard me tell this story. It, it for me, began with a, a late night email in 2011, which kind of feels hard to believe that it was that long ago. And it was a plea from one of my closest friends who basically wrote that she was in absolute dire straits. I mean, she was a woman who was a single mother of two. Um, she lived um, next door to me and she literally wasn't asking for any money she just wanted those of us who were nearest and dearest to her to understand her predicament that she'd been broke for a really really long time and she'd been hiding her circumstances from friends and family and i found it very painful to actually read the email and i actually felt quite ashamed that i hadn't even noticed her situation and that i wasn't more observant i'm like how could i be living so close to poverty and not recognize it. And my friend was one of these people who always had an easy smile, who worked really, really hard. I mean, she was someone who had worked probably from the time she was 15 years old until the moment she, she you know, she was laid off from her job. And that reality just hit me like, you know, like a thunderstorm. It's like, Phew. and I wrote her back and I said, what can I do? And she says, there's nothing you can do other than, you know, li listen. And th the next day, um, Occupy Wall Street was beginning in New York City. And I said, you know, maybe we should go down there and see what's going on. And perhaps there are folks like you who are sort of grappling with how they can articulate their frustrations and their predicaments. And we went down there and we sort of marched around the square in um, Zuccotti Park and we chanted until our throats were hoarse. And, you know, and I ended up going back multiple times and and shouting at the speaker's corner and, you know, imploring people to pay attention. But I realized that it still wasn't enough, that for all of the energy that I was putting in, it felt like 
there wasn't enough of an impact. And I really wanted to understand how did we get to this point where the American narrative had been so woefully corrupted in which we weren't talking about how poverty was reshaping and 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 transforming us in such ways that we were hiding it. And so mm -hmm. I decided to take this trip to Reading, Pennsylvania for a multitude of reasons. When I first went to that town, it was um, literally the poorest city of its size in all of America, which I found surprising that it was in Northeast. We tend to think of, you know, poverty in Appalachia or in the Mississippi Delta, but rarely do we think of poverty um, to that extent being only 50 minutes from Philadelphia, you know, in driving distance from New York City. And I found that alone to be infinitely fascinating. And I got to the city and I didn't know where to begin, but I just began interviewing people from the mayor to the police chief to folks who were living in a shanty town in the forest, to homeless folks, to business people, just trying to get a full portrait of what this city um, you know, what was happening in the city. But one of the things that I found fascinating, no matter who I asked, I, um, I'd say, can you describe your city to me? And they always said to me, Reading was. Never spoke of their city in present tense, never spoke of their city in past tense. And I, what I recognize is a, a city that couldn't think of itself in present tense was a city that had lost its narrative. And I saw this city as a microcosm of America. And in that moment, I thought we have lost our narrative mm. and that we are going to have real problems. And I think that, you know, with the election of Donald Trump and sort of the rise of sort of toxic white supremacy, um, it's become abundantly clear. But at the time when I was writing the play, I was still grappling with how do you tell this story of a fractured America, America that's fractured along racial and economic lines, an America in which we're all sort of forced to dwell in the same space, we're working in the same factories, and yet somehow we can't figure out ways in which we can communicate. And so that's really the evolution of sweat. And I found my story when I literally sat down in a circle with a group of steel workers who had been locked out of their factory for 92 weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, these, I, in the, these were predominantly white men and they told their stories and they cried. And I thought, wow, here I am, this black woman sitting in a circle of white people and I have tremendous empathy. And I thought, how can I process all of the complicated I, feelings that I have right now into a play. And that play became Sweat. Mm, mm, mm. And so here's um, an interesting, funny story I'll tell you about when I came to New York, went to New York to see Sweat. So my wife and I, we were going to see Sweat and we're running late. Um, and I think that we went to the wrong theater, actually, oh, first. Yeah. <laughs> and so we get to the right theater just as they're closing the doors and the house manager is trying to not let us in. Oh, no. And I'm like, you got to look. We got to get in. We got to. So he, he opens the door. I said, well, you know, my seats are on the aisle. They're right down. And so he lets us in and we're creeping down the aisle as the house lights are going down. Now, I had not read the play. I had seen trailers of the play from scenes set in the bar. Right. So when the lights come up and the first scene, they're in the parole office, I turned to Heather, I'm like, it's the wrong play. This is not what we came to see. This is not sweat. It's the wrong play. And so we're sitting there and we can't move because you know the play has started. I'm like, damn, I can't believe this. And so that, you know, the scene plays out and then the set turns and there the bar is. And I'm like, ah, okay, this is it. <laughs> this is it. But I was a wreck from the time the lights came up until the moment when the play opens with the bar. But, um, and, and from that point on, I was just, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a very, very good place. Um, Earlier, we were talking about uh, the Black Reps relationship and, you know, to your work. And so this is actually the third production of Lynn Nottage's work that we will produce, uh, having done Intimate Apparel Thank and you. Ruined. 
and now uh, Sweat and that another theater I directed comes from the Thank table you. of joy. So I just, of course, is a voice that I love and, you know, in trying to think about what it is, you sort of hit on it again. It's really the way that you deal with, you speak to humanity and give voice to those who don't have it. Um, and then of course, you know, in a play like Ruined, to be able to so vividly show us man's inhumanity to man, how inhumane we can be. Um, and I just, when I saw Sweat, I keep thinking about, you know, as you mentioned, this American narrative, because I think that a lot of the work we do is filling in those blanks in the American narrative. You know, we focus on those stories that don't get told and those voices that that don't have a platform or are not heard. And in sweat, it you know, it it takes in so many different characters and so many different stories. And I think the point of views of you know the 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 scene where the the two young guys confront Oscar, mm -hmm. you know, and because they don't have any place else to lay blame, you know, as as you say, they this commun they've been a community, and uh, they've been close, and they the who they need to strike out against they don't have the power to, and so it's that thing of where that causes us to internalize the oppression and, and the, the, the effects of the oppression. And it's also very telling to me because my stepfather worked at Granite City Steel mm -hmm. across the river on the east side. And I remember graduating from high school and um, getting my acceptance to Washington University and I remember overhearing a conversation between my mother and my stepfather and him saying, you know, he could go to college now if he wanted to, but he can come over and I can get him in the steel mill. Mm -hmm. I can get him in the steel mill. And, you know, with the fact that he's in college, I know I can get him upstairs. He wouldn't have to be. And, I, and that's, you know, in, your, in, the, in the show, in, the, in sweat, he wouldn't have to be on the floor he could start off upstairs. Mm. And he had been on the floor for 30 some odd years. And, you know, for him, for me to be, for him to be able to talk to somebody at the mill, get me a job, and I not have to be down there where he has spent his whole work life. Uh, it's just, it just resonates with me so richly in, 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 in the story of Sweat. and. Um, I thank you for it. I, I just, I mean, the, the voice that you have given those people. Well, thank you and, for sh sharing that, that story. It's so interesting. Um, what you said resonates because I remember a time when I was in college where um, during the summers or even after summers that many of us worked in factories. I, I didn't, but I remember my my roommate, my college roommate, she's like the best job that I can get is in a factory. I'm going to be paid more money than anything else. And it was immensely desirable. And she and she knew that if she stayed there, she could climb the corporate ladder. Um, well, I shouldn't say the corporate ladder. She could climb um, from the floor to the front office very quickly. But those kinds of opportunities really don't exist in the same way that they did um, when I was in, in college. And you talk about sort of the tension between the community. I grappled with several titles of the play. One mm. of them was Invisible City, but I thought, oh, that's overused. But the other one was The Cannibals. You know, it's the way in which when we become desperate, we cannibalize each other. And often we eat the person who's weakest and the person who's most vulnerable. There's a character in the play, um, um, who, who is, is Latinx. And when you see the play, he's the only person who's working from beginning to end, and yet he's wholly invisible. And that's done deliberately because often we don't see how hard people work and we take our workers for granted. And when he finally gives his speech, there's so many people who said, oh, I didn't see him there. And that's the point. 
is that you, you didn't see him, but you have to see him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ron, you mentioned um, Crumbs from the Table of Joys, the first Lynn Nottage play I ever read. It feels like decades ago. Yes, it um, was. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I do, I wonder, Lynn, your artistry has evolved and it's changed and it's continuing to change uh, through this wave of crisis and suffering, but also hope. And, and so I'm curious to hear, what are your hands set to now? Tell the audience, oh, sure, uh, what, sure, are you work, what are you working on? What are, what? What's, how are you evolving and emerging even now? Um, well, that's, a, that's such a fantastic question. I mean, I'm working on a lot of things, but one of the things that I'm, I'm sort of deeply immersed in, which really comes out of this COVID moment and sort of this cultural reckoning that we're in the midst of is something called the watering hole. Um, which is a project that the Signature Theater really designed to welcome people back into the theater in a gentle and loving and healing way. And I've deliberately invited 19 BIPOC theater makers to be in collaboration and to respond to the prompt of, you know, what do you desire and what do you hope to see when you return to theater? And they've created these installations that populate the entire theater space because one of the things that we wanted to do was really disrupt the notion of where theater can be. Um, and how theater can happen, because it's not enough to simply invite BIPOC folks into your theater space and say make theater. You really have to um, recognize the varying ways in which we may actually make that art. And that might mean that we don't want to put our art in the proscenium. We want, might want to put it in the lobby, or we might want to put it on the stairs, because that's where our story demands to be told. And so what we did with this piece is said, here's the entire theater where do you want to make your art? You know, so someone chose to make their art on the steps leading up to the theater because they wanted to figure out how do you welcome people into the space. Another person wanted to make their art deliberately in a hallway in the space that you never consider, the space that you pass, pass through, but they wanted you to stop and meditate on what it means to move from one place to another place. And so th that's so, that's one of the things that I was working with. It's really trying to figure out when we return from this COVID moment, what will theater look like? And to offer that. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we're having a little bit of a glitch. One of the things that I, is really thrilling to me, just listening to Lynn talk about um, the watering hole is that it feels like it is embracing what this last year has been that artists in this year where the theaters have been dark, you know, I think about all of the work, uh, Ron, that you have been doing at the Black Rep in these in the virtual world of bringing these productions um, to life and streaming them into people's homes that we've been doing creative placemaking and, and, you know, taking the art outside of the four walls of the theater, directly into unique communities. And um, that it does feel like this last year has been this embrace of stretching the boundaries of what art can be. And so Lynn, what I was just saying, what feels so moving to me about what you were talking about is that the experimentation and the innovation that has been birthed sometimes out of necessity in this last year is now um, being integrated back into the theater and how we might dynamically in our DNA have been changed yes. and catapulted into the future um, by this time. And the idea that when we return to the theater, that we can take the learning and the innovation and the exploration with us. I, uh, it's exciting. I think that's really true. I mean, I think what it feels to me that so many of the young artists are, are really leaning into um, different ways of telling stories. You know, they've we, we've been isolated and yet we've been connected through the digital realm. And I think that we're figuring out how can we continue the conversation that we began with that digital realm in a communal space because people don't want to let go of some of what they discovered, like you said, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, during COVID. And yet they want to re-enter that communal space. So it's really this brave new moment in which mm. we're, we've never, I mean, let's talk about last year was an unprecedented moment. 
you know, in my lifetime, I've never lived through anything, you know, and safe to say that none of us have lived. And it, of course, is going to change us in profound and fundamental ways, you know, the very, our very DNA, you know, and we are experiencing that. And as artists, there's no doubt that we're going to figure out new ways of expressing that. And the tools that we have before us just don't feel sufficient mm. for the expansive ways in which we want to heal, heal our souls and the w expansive ways in which we want to include new audiences and, you know, the expansive ways in which we want to process our trauma because we don't, I, you know, and speaking for myself, it's like, I feel like I don't want to see my trauma anymore. I want to figure out how can I process my trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm interested in what that art is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the things coming out of this too is that because we've stretched the boundaries so much and tested them, had to continue to test them to be able to just maintain ourselves and to keep a hold of ourselves, keep ourselves grounded, that the kind of work I think we'll see coming out of this will be new in so many ways. Uh, one, that the thing you mentioned, uh, Hannah, of reaching new audiences, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, not only are we producing work for the four walls and the audience that comes into those four walls, but I think that the virtual component of what we've been doing for the past year will continue to be part of the work we do mm -hmm. in some kind of way to different degrees for different theaters and for different artists. And so our, we will now see artists who are creating work to go into those different phases of, is this in the theater? Is it in the hallway? Is it on the stairs? Is it outdoors? Is it virtual? Uh, and, and is it now more accessible for everyone? And I think that that is one of the, one, one of the good things that will come out of this period that we were in for the past year is the way theaters found ways to make the work that we do accessible to audiences we do not, we have not or had not traditionally been able to reach. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's so interesting because one of the conversations that we're having around the watering hole is how do we make our work 100% accessible, you know, and it's ch it's challenging, not just accessible to to audiences that may not know that they want to be inside the theater, but also accessible to audiences that want to be in the theater. But because of um, life circumstances, it makes them very, very difficult for them to sit in seats and um, sit still in a seat and look up at the, the stage. And I think that accessibility is going to be one of the, the art interventions that's going to push our medium forward. And so I'm very excited about that. And I think also sort of devaluing the pre, the proscenium is going to be one of the art interventions that's going to push us forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It feels like a brave new world in some ways. Yes. Right? It's like rebirthing and reopening and reimagining and creating space for something new. And, um, you know, I, I will say that one of the things um, that has in, really inspired me um, through your career has been the fact that um, every time I crack open a new Lynn Nottage play or I enter a theater to see your work, I, I don't know what the form is going to be, that you're, okay. you're pushing form, that you're put, you know, that, um, and it's exciting. It's exciting to know and to say, uh, what has she come up with for us? You know, how is she cracking open our sense of humanity this time? And and um, and there are very few artists that have been able to um, sustain the type of career that you have and continue to stay. I think really, um, what feels like, at least from the outside, um, um, really curious and um, compelled by the stories inside of you that help push form, that help um, push the industry forward. Um, I know that, you know, there's been an announcement that you've got another big show opening in the fall. Yes. Is there anything you can tell us about that? I'm sure it's a show that um, um, ironically and very darkly was called Floyd's. Mm -hmm. And we premiered it in Minneapolis. 
and um, and so it's no longer called Floyd's. Um, it's called Clyde's. But I think that you know, I often think how strange that was. Mm. That I wrote this play called Floyd's, and, and that I started in Minneapolis. But the play is a comedy. And I specifically wanted to write something that was about mindfulness, something that was funny, something that was about the resur resurrection of the spirit. And it centers around um, a group of formerly incarcerated folks that work in, you know, a roads a roadside sandwich shop that's run by the devil, and. <laughs> They're just trying to get out of this liminal space, and they're really guided by um, a character named Montrellis, who I describe as Buddha from the hood, <laughs> who is trying to <laughs> teach them um, that they have all the tools that they need to survive. They just have to be able to recognize them. And so that's what the play is about, um, self-reflection and introspection and mindfulness. Wow. Wow. And I'm excited to share it with people. And for those of you who run theaters, it's only 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, that's that's an important uh, <laughs> element these days when we are trying to avoid intermissions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just putting it out there. It's only 90 right. minutes. <laughs> like of 90 minutes and no intermission. And no so intermission. Come in, take your seat. Yeah see the play and then and then, then you can still make dinner right and a comedy right. at that i love and a it. comedy yeah it's like and then the other thing that i'm i'm working on is um mj the musical and Ooh. and i have to mention today is the anniversary of michael jackson's death um and and so i'm working on this musical just in many ways to process all of the complicated feelings that I have about someone whose music really is the soundtrack of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting thing, I was, uh, we were talking to some guys the other day and we were laughing saying, yeah, today Michael would really be laughing at people as we all talk about living in our bubbles and everybody <laughs> was giving him so much grief. About one anymore, right? And it's like, Michael, once again, ahead of the curve, oh, ahead no. of everything, right? <laughs> He, had, he was in the bubble long before uh, we all found it necessary to live in bubbles. So yeah. that should be very good. Yeah, yeah it's, it's actually, it, I think it's it's going to be beautiful. I think people are going to be very surprised because it's a non-traditional musical um, with some of the greatest music ever written. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. it, I'm sure we'll have plenty of love. It's all love. It's all love. <laughs> all love. <laughs> I, I, I must say there are times where I have adopted Michael Jackson's um, critique when he said, gives a critique and does it with love. I, I have used that myself. I know he does it with love. I, that is said all, so many times. He's like, with love, with love. <laughs> That's not the note I wrote. With love. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, Lynn, you you you're talking about uh, your your work runs the gamut, and I'm so excited to hear about this comedy and now a musical. Um, I'm curious, what role do you think that you play in in the industry? Is it is it to bring light? Is it to bring healing? Is it to reveal? Um, especially. Funny. Especially now, what do you think that your role, and not just necessarily yours, but any writer, any playwright, any author, poet, um, what's the role? What is the I mean, what is the role of the of the artist? I mean, I think that the two people here also can answer that that question. I mean, I think that my role is to interpret and process, and to reveal and to illuminate and to heal and to soothe and to make people laugh and to do all of those things, sometimes all at once. And sometimes, you know, plays do diff different things. But I think right now, as we're coming out of this moment, we're desperately going to be looking to our storytellers to help, help process all of these insanely complicated feelings that we're all having. I mean, I know that I'm looking to my fellow artists for guidance and for ways to understand what we've just been through. And I think it's, a, it's an exciting time in some ways, like throughout COVID, I felt paralyzed as an artist. I felt 
I don't even know where to begin. I don't know what story I'm telling because I don't know where the story ends. And so as a result, I thought maybe my time right now is just to sit back and reflect and to absorb um, so that when I finally am blessed by the creative spirits that I'll know what story I need to tell. But I also think that uh, one of our roles is to be disruptors, is really to disrupt this the status quo, status quo and ask really provocative questions. You know, I was talking to um, the young director Miranda Heyman today, um, just um, about the watering hole and what we're doing and sort of the difference between sort of artists and everyone else. And I, what I describe is that my role as an artist is to walk to the very edge of that steep cliff, knowing that there's something beautiful that's beyond and knowing that there could be a gust of wind that sweeps me off, but I still have to walk to that edge of the cliff and then look down and describe what I see to the people who won't mm. walk there. And mm. so that's what I see um, you know, yeah. the artist's role is to be that person who steps out into that danger zone, yeah. um, into that uncomfortable space so that we can illuminate the space for others. Mm. That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit with that for a minute. <laughs> I saw that there was a question that came in from our audience. I don't know if we want to yeah, to the four. It's a it's a couple of, of really interesting comments. One is really a thank you um, from a current cast member of Malima's tale, who is just grateful to hear your perspective, Lynn. Um, yeah. And is is true. And I, I can read it. It's from Will Mann. It says it's so wonderful seeing you all on screen together. I'm a cast member of Malima's tale at the rep, and hearing Lynn's perspective is tremendously helpful. Wow. So thank you. Well, thank you. Well, and thank you for being in the show. Um, and, then, and then there was another question, just uh, Lena, process question. When you started to write Malima's Tale, did you know who the characters in the story would be or did that develop during your writing? In, in, I, when I began writing, writing Malima's Tale, I knew that I wanted to personify the elephant. I knew that Malima's voice had to be at the center um, and in some ways, I also knew uh, the journey that I wanted Malima's ghost to take mm -hmm. and all of the people that I wanted him to touch. And so um, I didn't know the specificity of those individual characters, but I knew who they were. And so in the process of writing, I discovered um, you know, who the game warden was and I discovered, you know, who the poachers were and what their backstory was. Um, so yeah, and I think part of the fun of writing it w was discovering who the next person would be that the person spoke to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a comment that is actually really interesting uh, that I want to lift because I experienced the same thing just as an audience member. And it says that there's something so breathtaking about how charming conversation in Malima's tale turns to corruption. Yes. Again and again, it's so wonderfully subtle. Mm -hmm. Anything well, you, you all want to speak to? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that because I think that a lot of times that kind of business is done by diplomats, people who are trained um, to be smooth and um, trained in the taunt and trained in a certain level of subterfuge. And I thought it was really interesting to have two people who can speak um, on multiple languages. You know, so on one level, they're talking about how beautiful um, the safari is, but we know that the subtext is something quite different, different, and it takes people who are very skilled to have that kind of dual dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, you know, I, I, as you were speaking, it connected back to my experience of sweat, which, you know, the complexity of the relationships you weave through every every person we meet, whether they connect at the bar, at work, in the, you know, how race layers in, how how class layers in, um, that that there's there's such nuance and subtlety and complexity to those relationships. Um, I remember going to New York to see Sweat and just afterwards not wanting to get out of my seat because I was still trying to take in 
all of the experience and how much of it harkened back to, you know, the communities I've lived in where industry has left. Right. And what happens when opportunity starts to exit and what rises from underneath that, how relationships that have been intertwined can suddenly start to drift. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I, I, I can't wait, uh, Ron, <laughs> I can't wait for a fall and for St. Louis to have the opportunity to experience that complexity, that story, because I do think that there are pieces of it that will resonate so strongly in our beloved city. And, and I think that it also is is so wonderful that uh, that you are here now in this city, and that you know this hopefully will be the first of you know this kind of collaboration where together we're able to lift up a playwright, where we're able to you know have work at both theaters at one point or another in our seasons and be able to um have our audiences see this work because you know for so many years it was we were doing it mm -hmm. and uh of course at this point you have a much larger audience who in many instances were not experiencing the work yeah. and so now you know we're sure that people who are seeing malima's tale now are going to want to see sweat Definitely. and then i am sure the next time we do something that has this kind of connection that is going to be so important for this community that we are finding the synergy that can drive the sort of cross fertilization of our audiences. Yeah, that's so beautiful. I think that um, sort of those artistic conversations and dialogues across institutions is like the next level of art making. Mm -hmm. I think there's something really beautiful about that dialogue that can um, I it can can sort of create sort of larger audiences, but a new way of making theater as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's easy. Well, to, I have to say. You know, I can I can tell you one of the things I would dream is that the play begins at St. Louis a Rep and ends at your theater run or vice versa where you know in order to see the entire play you have to go to both institutions and you know because the thing that i i noticed when you, we were talking about malima's tale earlier and you were talking about conversations that you're hearing in the lobby hana as people are coming out the theater those sounded like completely different conversations than would be in the lobby coming out of the black rep Yes, I'm sure. Right? <laughs> Completely. I'm like, really? They're talking about safaris and, you know, <laughs> and, and, and the ivory in their house is okay. And the ju ivory jewelry they're wearing. The, the, these are the conversations they're having. Hmm, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Well, I was going to say that, you know, it, it's easy to to want to collaborate with the Black Rep. Ron knows this, but I, I, I like to say it as often as I can. You know, the Black Rep is one of our legacy theaters and Ron, yes. you know, is the iconic leader um, in the American theater. And so when I came to St. Louis, I was um, eager to get to see shows at the Black Rep and to be able to to you know walk alongside you is really a great honor. So I'm I'm excited about the future and our collaborations and um and and grateful for the path you've paved for someone like me to be in this position. Um, there is no me without you and what you've created, um, not just in St. Louis but for the field. And um, and I think that's important to say and for people to know. I definitely yeah. amplify that. Yeah, I, you know, and it's and it's it's been you know, tell you, I, I don't know, Lynn, if you remember, uh, I think actually it was for Intimate Apparel that I had to call you. Yes, because, right, because the uh, at the the rep was holding up me being able to get the rights to Intimate Apparel at a time when they had no interest in doing Intimate Apparel, but. Um, the, the, the hold was there. And so I called you and you helped to facilitate. I well, you know, I, it's, that, it's, yeah. I mean, one of my philosophies, and I'm very intentional, is if one of the black theaters in a city wants to do my show, I will generally 
give them the rights first. Mm -hmm. It was like, by the way, meet Vera Stark. Um, right. The Guthrie one to do it and Penumbra one to do it. And I knew that I'd make far less money <laughs> with Penumbra, but I, I said they can have the rights. And it's the same, you know, in, for the Lorraine Hansberry Theater in, in, um, in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, I just feel like if the call is made to me that I will tend to support the theaters where I think my work will have a wonderful home and will be respected and be nurtured and be loved in ways that I appreciate. Not to say that I'm not happy for them to go to the big stages because <laughs> God knows I'm immensely happy for <laughs> the shows. But I think it's, in, I, I just think it's important as, as a theater artist that we, we, honor our roots yeah, and right. that we, you know, and we nurture those theaters because they're so essential. Yeah. Well, I think how we'll have to start thinking now about mm -hmm. how Clyde's is going to transition <laughs> from the black <laughs> rep to the rep. <laughs> because yeah, I'm, I going mean, make, I'm going to make that call. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I would love to figure out like what, what creative thing we could do. Yeah. You know, because in, I just plant that seed. Maybe, it doesn't take place in either of your theaters. Mm -hmm. It takes, it's something that you sponsor that takes place in a diner, you know? <laughs> I think there are a lot of exciting possibilities. There's possibilities for co-producing um, that, yes. that doesn't anchor it to, to the space, but anchors it to the philosophies of the theater. Amen. I think we have an open possibility for dreaming together and that yeah. excites me beyond, you know, anything else. Um, including this conversation has been so like soul filling for me, yeah. you know, at the end of a long week to be able to share this time with artists that I so respect and admire and appreciate and am inspired by. Um, it's just a gift. And I, I, I say thank you to both of you for um, letting uh, this conversation happen and for us to be able to share that with our communities and both locally and nationally. Yeah. Well, I have to say, Hannah, during this past year that, just your voice has been incredible, incredible nourishment for me. I have the mm -hmm. utmost respect for you. And I think that you are a goddess and <laughs> anything you ask, I will do just because I know how deeply invested you are in community yeah. and in supporting and nurturing community. And I don't think that many people understand how fiercely protective Hana is of all of us. And I think it's important to sort of put that out into the world. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I think this is a perfect time to to share a comment in the chat that I think many artists would would agree with. And it says, Lynn, your feeling of being paralyzed during during the pandemic gives me a release for what I and other creatives felt. Thank you. Clarity, compassion and blessings. Thank you so, so much. And there, there's a ton of thank yous that are pouring in, um, and and also in that spirit of collaboration, I think I think that the chat is excited. They can't wait to see what we dream up. <laughs> <laughs> they can't wait to see what we dream up. This is exciting. Um, and again, congratulations are coming in, Lynn, to you and all the new work um, that you are that you are stewarding and, yeah, and nursing right now. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. Thank you all. It's been uh, a privilege and an honor for me to uh, be on this uh, platform with the three of you, three, you know, brilliant, creative women with broad shoulders, with okay. broad shoulders. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And if there is any, I'm going to flash across the screen uh, just ways for the chat for all of our audience members to follow Ron at the Black Rep, follow Hannah at the Repertory Theater, and also Lynn's website so you can just keep your eye on what they are doing. Uh, just give me one moment. You all can continue to talk. We've got to release Lynn soon because she's- I want to shout out Lynn's Twitter. One of my favorite folks on Twitter, when I want to know <laughs> where the pulse is, I'm like, what is Lynn talking about on Twitter? So follow Lynn on Twitter if you don't. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have to say, I, I, I love Twitter. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I, it's Twitter literally got me through this pandemic. 
you know, when, in a moment when I felt so incredibly disconnected from community, I knew that I could go into Twitter and I would find folks that I knew and I could have dialogues with them and I could find folks that I didn't even know who I now know. And it's, it's weird because they're people who I consider friends who I have never e even seen a picture of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've had these very intense dialogues on, on Twitter. So thank you, Hannah, for that <laughs> shout out. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. It's been a joy being in community with you. We've got to release Lynn. She's on her way to an opening. Um, but it is such a joy. And we thank you for your constant pouring that you continue to do through the ages for all of us. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Hannah. Good night to everyone. Appreciation. Thank you. Thank Bye. you all. Good night. Everybody. Thank you.